So the next uh, presentation is on-site wastewater treatment systems. Uh, the presenter is going to be Pio Lombardo. Pio Lombardo has, been a, 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 has a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering and a master's in civil engineering, along with 45 years of experience with innovative water quality evaluations and restoration projects in wastewater management for on-sewer community projects. Pio has been the engineer of record for innovative decentralized wastewater and water quality restoration projects with capital costs greater than 200 million that are operating, th operating throughout the United States. LAI is considered a national expert on decentralized wastewater management, alternative sewer system, and passive nitrogen and phosphorus removal techniques that have been determined by numerous independent parties as only the only septic system that reliably achieved the limits of technology and centralized sewer systems. Pia Lombardo has uh, authored and has been a contributor to eight U.S. EPA manuals since 1979 on decentralized and wastewater management issues. Pia author, authored the first version of the USPA water quality model, HSPF, which is widely used for total maximum daily load determinations to achieve water quality standards. Thank you, Dennis. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, as Chuck mentioned, uh, Lombardo Associates was retained by Connecticut DEP uh, to address this inventory and analysis of uh, OWTS, uh, either septic systems or even advanced uh, wastewater treatment systems on nitrogen loadings on the coastal uh, Connecticut watersheds. Now, uh, what does that mean? Uh, this slide illustrates the study area. We're talking about 82 watersheds that traverse or are located within 71 coastal towns in Connecticut. Now, our scope of work consisted of uh, a series of reports that we have prepared. That's a, a listing of them uh, from an inventory of the data that each community has so that we could determine, you know, how granular we could get the data uh, to a, an inventory of uh, OWTSs, and we did a lot-by-lot lot analysis that I'll get into some details in a bit. Uh, this project was really building upon the uh, vaudry yukon uh, study that Chuck referred to, so we reviewed that and identified uh, what some of its limitations are. Uh, we then looked at what we call the uh, OWTS conditions, the loadings, and the environmental settings. The, what that means is that we looked at the soil, sufficient geology, and watershed characteristics that influence nitrogen attenuation. Because now we're, we're talking about, and I'll go over the numbers, but approximately 200,000 OWTSs in these coastal watersheds that are discharging nitrogen into the ground, and there's attenuation or nitrogen removal that occurs prior to uh, that nitrogen plume uh, entering the embayment of interest. Uh, so we'll go through the science of that. We then uh, were tasked with looking at management approaches for uh, decentralized systems. We did a literature search on what are the technologies, how well do they work, et cetera, et cetera for nitrogen removal and then looked at regulatory uh, and non-regulatory approaches to dealing with managing it, uh, and then did a preliminary assessment of uh, the impact of climate change on OWTSs, in particular in terms of prospective impact on nitrogen removal. Um, so in, when we start looking at the, uh, and the, the work that we did was uh, A, uh, pulling together the readily available information, and then we did some data mining. Uh, we went into the Department of Public Health uh, and into DEP files and extracted information from that regarding larger uh, uh, septic systems or even treatment facilities, uh, OWTS systems. So this table here illustrates the number of systems uh, 
the Baudry study uh, did their analysis based upon census tracts. And they took the population or housing information on that, from those census tracts and assigned nitrogen loading to that population housing, okay? They did not look at uh, commercial facilities and institutional uh, system. So to get a handle on that, what we refer to as non-residential flow, we went ag again into the DPH files, went back to 76, uh, and to see what was actually built. So you'll see the numbers there that the vast majority of the systems are uh, re residential, and you'll see that that represents pretty close to 24 million gallons of wastewater being discharged uh, per day. Uh, and then the DPH OWTS systems that are non-residential, and we only looked at systems that uh, had flows over 1,000 gallons a day, so that we didn't get mired in a lot of, let me call them mice. Uh, so there's, you know, the permitted flow there is about 1.4 million gallons a day, and you can see the nitrogen loading there is about 57,000 kilograms per year. Uh, then there's also the UIC, the Underground Injection Control uh, Program. Uh, that, there's only uh, 33 of those. And then there's the groundwater subsurface discharge permits that are issued by DEP, and you'll see the numbers there. Now, if you look over at the nitrogen loading column, you'll see that the, the loading from the UIC on a per unit basis is significantly higher than the GIS, uh, the subsurface disposal systems. The reason for that is that the UIC systems are assumed to be septic systems. So effluent from a septic system was assumed to be at 60 milligrams per liter, whereas the GSS systems are treatment facilities and those all are permitted, are required to have a total nitrogen effluent of less than 10. So that gives you the big picture of how many of these systems are out there. And, you know, again, it's really, you're looking at 24 million gallons of wastewater being discharged to the ground that ultimately is getting into the embayments and then into Long Island Sound. Now, in addition to this, we looked at the seasonal population influence, because naturally the coastal area has beach, uh, beaches and, and those communities see a seasonal population during the summer. We estimated based upon technique or numbers that exist in other seasonal uh, population, seasonal areas, uh, where the, the population of the flows will double, triple, or quadruple, you know, during the summertime, that when you look at that, that that adds about 7.4% more nitrogen than if it's not being considered. Now, one of the other issues that we were tasked to address was what type of systems are out there and what's their condition. Uh, in our opinion, uh, virtually all of the OWTS systems are expected to be some type of form of septic tank drain field uh, type system. Uh, we don't expect to see many cesspools in the ground because they were banned in Connecticut uh, in the late 50s. And the typical life of a, uh, uh, of a septic system is 60 plus or minus years, and so it's well beyond that. So any cesspools that were in the ground, we expect, have been uh, replaced. Uh, now, we, do a, we did a lot by lot analysis, and I'm going to come back to this later because there's a lot of details here, and I want to go through the, uh, uh, the rest of the project. Uh, okay, we looked at the, uh, the Yukon study, and this slide illustrates uh, what are the issues that we uh, identified. Uh, first of all, as I mentioned earlier, they only looked at residential uh, loads, no non-residential no non loads, that should state, not non-commercial, but those non-residential. Uh, Vardry looked at a broad measure of attenuation or nitrogen removal and basically assigned that, you know, she looked at uh, 
septic systems, and they also look, they assign different numbers to cesspools. Again, there's very few of them, but their study also looked at areas of Long Island, which does have a lot of cesspools. So, uh, but they use uh, in their projections, you know, a, let's say, 58% for a typical septic system when it's within 200 meters of the embayment. When it's further away from that, they assign the attenuation at that 65.6%. So those were very broad numbers. Uh, and did not look into the details of soil, superficial geology, and surface water that we're going to address shortly. Uh, again, uh, she didn't, uh, seasonal water or seasonal use was not considered. Uh, the po it was a population-based analysis based upon the 2010 uh, census, and uh, she did not have available the refined sewer service area uh, at when that study was done. And we had the advantage of getting the most current sewer service areas uh, from Chuck's office. Okay, and our task three and 1.3 analysis addressed these limitations. That was our, that was part of our objective. Now, in this slide, you'll see that the, uh, bear with me. This slide illustrates the attenuation process, okay? And to the extent that you can see it, I don't know if I can go over there and you hear me, but, their one zone is just below the drain field, and that, the attenuation that occurs in that zone is dictated by the soil types. And the, in particular, the texture is the characteristic that determines the amount of nitrogen removal occurs here. Then there's a Vado zone, which is the unsaturated zone between the bottom of the, this treatment zone, number one, and groundwater, and, uh, it, and by the way, I should mention that the analysis that we did and numbers that we applied here was all based upon the Chesapeake Bay uh, efforts, which were pretty extensive uh, and ongoing, as well as the work that's being done by the Massachusetts Estuary Project. So we basically took their methodologies, information, and amalgamated it to uh, and the the conditions in Connecticut and applied those numbers for the analysis. The Vado zone is assumed to have zero impact on nitrogen removal. The saturated zone is zone number three, and the saturated zone is influenced by surficial geology. And we know that in Connecticut coastal watersheds, by and large, the uh, the surficial geology. Thank you. The superficial geology is glacial fill. Uh, and then there's a transition zone that's ref that combines the, uh, the shoreline influences as well as the in-stream or in-pond influences that occur where additional nitrogen removal can, can happen. Uh, this can be repeated as uh, watersheds go from sub-basins to sub-basins to ultimately getting into uh, the embayment. So a septic plume that goes through multiple ponds before it gets to the embayment gets nitrogen attenuation to a significant level. So again, uh, in terms of zone one, uh, that's a soils removal impact. Soil texture really dictates that. The superficial geology, we really looked at the glacial and post-glacial deposits, and basically uh, the tighter the soils, the more attenuation uh, that occurs. And as you can anticipate, you get you get mic what happens. You get microzones of anaerobic and aerobic activity that achieves the nitrogen removal. Uh, just to repeat the science, the nitrogen removal occurs in an anaerobic environment. Uh, and then again, the drainage basin one. So, so that's what we, uh, those are the techniques. Now, and to provide additional context, uh, this is the 
This is a table from uh, Vartry's work that gives you a sense of the significance of the nitrogen loading uh, on these abatements. Uh, ignore the colors here. The key thing to focus on is this column to the right, and it's what we call the normalized nitrogen loading to the abatement. It's kilograms of nitrogen per hectare of surface area of the abatement per year. Now, there's researchers have, that have looked at this and who claim that one of the benchmarks is uh, seagrasses, and they have concluded that when you go over, when you go over 50 kilograms per hectare per year, you're going to get into impaired uh, conditions. When you go over 100, there's no eelgrasses that are going to be in that area. So, an eelgrass is a benchmark that's used in terms of is there impairment or not. And you will see all of these watersheds, the lowest one here is 470. So they're all exceeding that abatement. And the bottom figure here illustrates their location with the red areas being the higher numbers uh, and the green areas being the, the middle. The other thing that you want to be sort of sensitive to is what percent of the load to the embayment is associated with OWTS techniques. And you'll see it varies quite a bit, but there's many watersheds where it's well over 50%. So the OWTS uh, impacts for those watersheds is the elephant in the room. So it's not an insignificant issue uh, for many of those for many of those watersheds. Okay, so it gives you context in, in terms of impact, and then how are we uh, updating the information. Now, uh, I'm gonna go quickly through, so we don't run out of time here, I'm gonna go quickly through the technique we use, but here's the soils attenuation uh, technique that was used. Here's the soil textural class, and we, for each soil type that exists in Connecticut, we assigned it a, uh, an attenuation, and there was three categories. Uh, the low end was 16%, and the high end was the 54 and you can see that soil texture really talks to you about the, the tightness of the soil. The white areas of the map are the sewage service areas, so they're really areas of, you know, they're really there's no OWTSs in those areas, but you'll see that the vast majority of it is green. And the green indicates 16%. So in other words, uh, we're seeing that the soil's influence is not that great, not that high. It's, it's there and it's important, but uh, it's in that 16% range for most of the area. Now when we look at the superficial geology, this was that zone three that I referred to, uh, the tight soils were assumed to be removing 30%, and these are compounded. So it's 30% of what remains after the uh, soil's impact was added. Um, and again, you'll see that the vast majority of the area is going to be the tight soils, the orange area, because most of the uh, surficial geology is glacial. Now, I, the, one of the questions is, where does 30% come from? That's frankly a professional judgment. Uh, there's no data around in nationally Chesapeake Bay and doesn't have this type of sufficient geology, nor does uh, you know, the MEP area, which is pretty much the case. Uh, the, the, uh, one of the other factors is nitrogen attenuation going to what we call surface water. Again, these plumes are traveling through, uh, now they're in a surface water body, whether it's a stream or a pond, and those are the uh, reductions that occur uh, associated with each one of those. In terms of the color coding, the yellow area gets very high uh, nitrogen attenuation. We're seeing the, the yellow area was over 85%. The orange area was between 
70 uh, to 85. The blue is down to the 50 percent range. But you'll see that the upper watersheds, as you would expect, get a fair amount of attenuation as those plumes travel through these streams um, and the ponds within the south watersheds. Now, uh, this is clipped from one of our tables for each one of the uh, watershed for the embayments, the 82, we then were able to calculate a compounded attenuation factor for the entire watershed. And you'll see the range goes from zero and some, which are directly, dis those zeros are directly discharging into Long Island Sound to the areas where it can be well over 50%. Uh, and then the, the weighted average is about 75% is what we found. So it's a fairly high number, uh, but we put a little caution on that because the influence of the surface water is significant and there's, there's some sensitivity of what we would call uh, calibration or that field calibration validation that really needs to occur to feel more confident with these numbers. Uh, now the next activity we, we uh, excuse me, sorry. so this is a figure, I get a little confused because there's two slides on the, on the monitor here. Uh, so this is a illustration of the compounded uh, attenuation factors taking into account soils, superficial geology, and the watershed. So again, the color Se sequence of the yellow and the orange being very high uh, predominates and is heavily influenced by the uh, surface water factor. Okay, so that's the, the loading and the imp loading impacts on the uh, coastal maintenance. The, the, the remainder of the project, we looked at the management approaches. Uh, you may be familiar with EPA's five levels of management uh, from, in most areas within Connecticut operate a level three, uh, where there's sort of operating permits, if you will, that are issued by the health department or DEEP for the uh, project. Uh, we can get into these details if anyone's any, uh, interested on them, because with your WPCAs, this is obviously your business. We also looked at, uh, we provided a summary of what's done in other areas of the country that are managing OWTS. Uh, by and large, most of them are uh, operating similar at the level three. Uh, the more aggressive ones are uh, four and five, where there is a utility function that gets taken on where the utility, the WPCA, if you will, for that area operates the OWTS, that's what four is, and then five is where the R&D would have ownership uh, and operation of the OWTS. And that is done by the Florida Keys uh, Aqueduct Authority, and they own and operate the wastewater system, in particular, uh, because they're all advanced on-site wastewater treatment systems. Uh, all of the other areas are doing various facets of the management program, uh, not getting into the actual ownership or the actual operation. The operation is still being held predominantly by the system owner. Okay, next one was we looked at the treatment technologies that are out there, and uh, I'm sure your engineers and uh, practitioners know the, the, the categories are either a typical septic tank, a uh, leaching pool, or a drain field system. Then the treatment technologies, they're either going to fall into the category of suspended growth, activated sludge type system, or an integrated fixed film activated sludge system, or a pure fixed film uh, uh, system. These technologies, in our opinion, these technology types get this type of removal uh, in the treatment technology, and then 
we see some removal in the drain field. However, when you start treating the wastewater, the food for nitrogen removal in the drain field or in that soil zone gets diminished because there's no more food or the food is diminished. Uh, so this is what we, in our opinion, is typical for nitrogen removal for these technologies which are more the norm in the industry. Now, to get really high levels of nitrogen removal, by and large, one has to have a carbon feed system on the effluent of these technologies, or go with a cluster system where there's a, a, an advanced treatment system. When one goes with a carbon feed system, one can get down to the limits of technology of less than three milligrams per liter. And so, so that's the outline of the technologies that exist. Uh, in the report, we get into the science and all of the significant details. Here's the findings that uh, this is a summary of the work that was done in Oregon uh, in the early 2000s. They field tested for two years with monthly sampling at East Residential Property, and there was two for each technology. And this is a the actual effluent data. The best technology got under three, and uh, a good number of them were in the teens and, and 20s. And then, obviously, some of these didn't really make the grade. Uh, this is from the EPA manual on, uh, that was published for uh, federal facilities in Chester Bay. And then Suffolk County, New York, which I'm sure you're familiar with, has a serious uh, OWTS nitrogen contamination problem. They did some testing on uh, selected technologies that their consultant screened and went out and sampled these in different locations. And you can see that uh, and these technologies were required by uh, code to be under 10. And you can see here that uh, typically achieved and very low numbers were uh, achieved. These, they went out and tested actual operating systems in different parts of the country. So, uh, so that's the technology. Now, you probably, many of you, I'm sure, have familiar with the efforts that uh, are going on, uh, and it's in the DPH code now for uh, putting wood media underneath the drain field for nitrogen removal. So, I'm just showing that slide, and we've summarized that data, and there's a lot of interest uh, in this approach in Florida. Uh, actually in Connecticut, that's been in New York, uh, and in, on the Cape. Uh, some people refer to this as the layer cape approach, etc. Uh, there's also a two-stage approach. This is from the work that was done in Florida, where basically there's a nitrification unit, uh, and then there's a uh, uh, denitrification unit using the same uh, medium. In our opinion, this approach is superior, and you know, for full disclosure, we have championed this approach for 20 years now. Uh, and the, the cost issues, uh, we can, I can get into, but in our opinion, the cost uh, performance ratio here is, is better. But the, we have summarized all that information and provided it to the, uh, as part of our reports. The other technique that's used is permeable reactive barriers for nitrogen removal. And the way this works is that basically the treatment system is put into the ground. Uh, we know that OWTS systems do a very good job at nitrification. They're basically single pass sand filters. And they do an excellent job of converting everything to nitrates. The real challenge is getting that nitrate denitrified. So a PRD. Uh, can intercept that stream and basically provides the carbon source for denitrification. And here's an example of a system that we engineered 15 years ago down on Cape Cod. And you'll see this, that's where the system was installed. There's no algae here, whereas on other sides of it, there was a lot of algae. There was a nice micro zone here created. And the actual data here shows the influence was close to eight milligrams per liter, and it came out below 0.05, that's a log scale, uh, 
uh, graphs there. So you can, and the beauty of that approach is that uh, it's passive. Once you put it on the ground, leave it alone. You don't have to do anything besides monitor it periodically. Uh, we looked at the non-regulatory and regulatory approaches uh, that I'm sure many, if not most of you are familiar with, public. DPH regulates everything uh, under 7,500 gallons per day. That's not a IA technology or an innovative alternative technology. So these are basically large septic systems. Uh, DEP, through its 2006 guidance, deals with all uh, IA technologies and large systems over the 7,500 gallons a day. All IA technologies require that DEP permit. And this is one of the, let me call it, gaps in, that in our opinion exist in Connecticut. And I'll get into that in a minute. You know you have the ability for towns to set up their own uh, decentralized wastewater management district. <clears throat> but again, the, the state is lacking a design guide for IA technologies under 7,500 gallons a day. A number of states have have developed them, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, etc. And uh, to get a DEP permit for these systems, Frank, as I'm sure many of you know, is very cumbersome and onerous and expensive to the extent that it's a barrier. Uh, so I'm going to wrap it up with one more slide here. And then we looked at the climate change uh, impact. Uh, and just to summarize, you know, the climate change projections are that by 2050, uh, there's an expectation of between one and a half and three feet of sea level rise, and then by 2100, uh, three to six feet sea level rise. And uh, the question is that we looked at was what does that mean to groundwater? Okay, and uh, the short answer is that there was a couple of studies that we uh, were able to rely upon, one in uh, New Haven Harbor, and the other one was just recently published on the coastline of New Hampshire that this figure illustrates, and it shows that the groundwater rise associated with sea level rise can be noticed three, up to three miles inland, and it's all influenced heavily by, as you would expect, sufficient geology. Um, and these colors here, on, you know, the, the map show that uh, the dark colors represent what percent of sea level rise was noticed in these areas. And the red, for instance, is uh, over 70%. So you can see that the influence is quite noticeable. Uh, in other words, what, what this means for nitrogen loading to the south from OWTS is that what we assume, just for getting a rough number, is that OWTSs that are located south of 95 are likely to be negatively impacted by sea level rise. In other words, they're probably going to lose that se separation between the bottom of their grain field and groundwater and going to lose that nitrogen removal that occurs, as well as they could be contributing bacterial contamination, because now they're not going to be getting the proper, uh, you need a minimum of two feet of unsaturated soils. So, um, so that's the, the general, uh, what do you call it, direction that we believe the climate change uh, uh, impacts are going to have as well as the USGS projects that uh, there'll be an increase, from the increased precipitation, there's going to be an increase in recharge, which will also raise the groundwater cables. And those things are going to negatively impact uh, nitrogen removal and OWTS systems. So with that, I have 